Welcome to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. This podcast is brought to you by SavingYouTaxes.com and hosted by J. Barry Watts. As an advanced tax strategist and enrolled agent federally licensed by the IRS, Barry is uniquely qualified to go deeper into the Internal Revenue Code than most accountants. He understands and interprets its provisions explaining how they'll help you reduce income taxes you owe so you can direct that previously wasted tax money into tax-free accounts that you can enjoy in your retirement years. Now, on today's episode... Have you ever wished that you could put as much as you want to in your Roth IRA with no limits? Well, today on The Truth About Taxes and Retirement, we're going to unpack a little-known mechanism that provides tax-free income without the income or contribution limits that accompany a normal Roth IRA. If tax-free income is your desire, then you'll want to absorb every word of this edition of The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. And now here's our host, J. Barry Watts. Uh, Welcome to this edition of The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. I am Barry Watts, and welcome to the studio, my co-host, retirement designer, tax strategist, and state senator, Eric Burleson. Good to be here. We're glad that you're here today. So, Eric, I want to start off by just asking you a simple question. If they would change the rules on Roth IRAs so there were no income limits and no limit on how much you could contribute, how much would you want to put into a tax-free Roth IRA? That's a great question. You know, Anytime you see limits that the federal government has put on something, it means it's really good. So they want to limit how much you can how much you can utilize. So in my opinion, I'd want to put as much money as I could. As much money as possible. You know, I've asked that question to a lot of people over the years, and the answer I always get is as much as possible. Well, I've got some news for you. They haven't changed the rules. So uh, the question was kind of a silly question because there are rules that do limit on how much you can contribute to a Roth IRA. But we do have an asset management vehicle and strategy that is tax-free, like a Roth, and it doesn't have any income or contribution limits. And that's what we're going to talk about on the show today. So um, let's begin by thinking first about what uh, the major concerns that a person ought to have as they look toward retirement. One of those major concerns, rather, is going to be increasing uh, income taxes. I don't think there's any question taxes are going to go higher. Uh, The law already says they'll be higher in 2026. I think with the change in administration, they're probably likely to go higher sooner than that. And I think within the next 10 years, we'll probably see taxes double. We've got a podcast on that whole topic, if someone's uh, interested in that, rather. Um, The second major concern people have is often long-term health care. And the big question that's born out of this tax issue and this health care issue is in light of those two things, do I have enough money? Or will I have to depend on the government later in life? Yeah. And I think we've seen that come to light this this year. The need for really good, not just long-term care, but good long-term care. Well, and we've also seen this year a dependence on government for money, uh, a socialism creeping in kind of attitude. And, and you know, when you think about where the government gets its money, if you were going to depend on the government, Where does the government get its money? But from the people. The government doesn't have any money of its own. When people talk about, well, I'll just get some government money. I'll just let the government pay for it. It's the people. It's you and me who are paying those bills. And so the only way the government can get more money is they either tax it out of the people or they print it. And if you'll think about it, printing money is actually kind of tax in another form. Yes, it's just tax that uh, it's just taxing the money that you've got sitting in the bank. Yeah. Reduces its value. Did you know that the money supply, I can't believe I'm talking about money supply here, by the way, I remember the long haired dude at the university of Missouri back in the early eighties, who was standing up at the board talking about M one and M two, which are the two measures of money supply. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I didn't care. All I wanted was my grade so I could get out of there. And here I am on a podcast today talking about M (laughs) one and M two. That's just a crazy thing. But the money supply, as of October 2020, uh, and when they measure the year-over-year growth of how much money is in circulating, the money supply has increased this year by 37.08%. What that means is the government has injected 37% more money into the economy than existed in the year before. They printed 37% more money. And so what that means is a dollar in 2020 has only about 63% 
of its power to command goods and services that it had in October of 2019. So you see, you've really been taxed and it just happened quietly and you didn't know it uh, and weren't paying any attention. And it happened while people were shouting and yelling uh, and screaming for the government to give them more money. And this has kind of produced a sense of good times that we are experiencing. You know, the stock market is at an all-time high. Yesterday, many of the accounts we manage, including my own, hit an all-time record high. And that's exciting. We all feel good about that. But then you go back and realize, well, but my dollar's worth 63 cents uh, on the dollar compared to what it was a year ago, 37% less. So it takes some of the punch out of that. Right. And then you look at interest rates. Well, interest rates are at all-time lows. And so there's plenty of capital available. This is a great time to borrow cheap money if you're wanting to build something or expand, expand your business in some way. And yet all of this good news doesn't really come from pure economic conditions. That's where I, as an economist, to the degree that I am, I do have a degree in economics, but it's where I, as an economist and a, a financial planner and a strategist, uh, get a little bit concerned because I want to see uh, money supply increasing because of uh, pure economic conditions. I want to see the markets doing well because of uh, purely how much we're producing in the country. And instead, what we're seeing now is kind of a false uh, politically motivated actions uh, like this ginormous increase in the money supply. They're effectively diluting the power to purchase. And it feels good, but it portends a future that kind of scares me. Uh, you see, the government controls not only the money supply through the Federal Reserve, they also control interest rates. And I think those rates are being kept at falsely low levels. And the reason is because the government owes so much money. And so if interest rates were back at normal levels, the amount of interest that the government would have to pay on its own debt would be so great as to uh, essentially crash the budget and uh, destroy the government's economy. So they have an interest in keeping things at a low level. So the government's printing more money. Interest rates are kind of low. We've got all these plates spinning all these plates spinning. It's kind of like when you were a kid and you were out late for the first time when you were supposed to have been home and, and uh, some kids at least rushed to make up lie after lie after lie after lie about where they were and why they were late and whose fault it was and all those kinds of things. They spin all these plates until somewhere their story unravels and right. the first plate falls. Right. So, you know, and often the Fed, they try to control inflation. They try to anticipate it, but the economy dictates you know, inflation. So if inflation were to incur and suddenly the Fed is having to control that inflation, the only way to do that is to do what Volcker did uh, back in the day. What was that? 30, 40 years ago, yeah. where raised, raised interest rates. And if the, if the Fed suddenly raises interest rates, then our federal government is now paying a lot more in interest on the debt that they owe which you can see where that's come, where that is going to go. The well, impact that that would have on the federal, on the federal budget. That would be one of the plates falling. And my concern is that when the first plate falls, that then all the plates that are being spun on the tops of the sticks begin to fall. And that creates a real disaster in our economy. So uh, the question is, what can we do about all of that? And in order to get your brain around this, what I want you to do is I want you to draw two big circles in the air. Okay. On the left side and the right side, you got two circles. And in the circle that is on the left side, I want you to write these words, things that matter, things that matter. And in the circle that's on the right side, I want you to write the words, things we can control, things we can control. Now, I want you to take those two circles and I want you to move them closer and closer and closer to each other until they overlap a little bit. This is called a Venn diagram is what's this called. And so in the area that overlaps, the things that matter and the things that we can control, that's where we need to focus all of our time and energy on things that matter and things that we can control. And it really comes down to a very few set of things. You know, we can't do anything about interest rates. We personally, individually can't do anything about that. Right. We, we can't do anything about tax rates individually and personally. But there are things that we can do because of what we see happening. We can address those increasing income taxes and long-term health care kinds of costs. And so that's what I really want to focus on in today's 
uh, podcast about how we can change those kinds of things. So, but the big question is then how do you do that? Well, I'm going to go to the tax code because the tax code is our friend. Everybody thinks it's their enemy. And it is your enemy to a degree because, you know, the tax code is full of all those red lights that are going off that say stop and pay tax here, stop and pay tax here. But we're forgetting that the tax code also has all these green lights that are saying you may go through and not pay a tax. You may go through and not pay a tax. So I want to go to the tax code and find the benefits that are in the code. And the first place that I find a benefit to address what we're talking about today, which is how to uh, have a much larger tax-free retirement income, is in section 7702 of the Internal Revenue Code. So if you have any desire to look that up, you can Google section 7702 of the Internal Revenue Code. And here's what you're going to find. It sets out a set of rules for an account that you can put money into. Now, this account's got some very specific um, criteria that are important to it. First of all, this allows the money that's in this account to grow without being taxed. And I think that's a pretty good deal if your money can grow without being taxed. Secondly, it has no limit on how much money you can put into this account. And, you know, the reason that's so important is because you're limited on how much you can put into a traditional tax-free IRA account or Roth IRA account. Um, thirdly, it allows you to withdraw the money and spend it however you please without paying any taxes on it. So if the money can grow tax-free, there's no limit on how much you can put in, and you can take the money out and spend it without paying taxes, that's a pretty good deal. Now, now be aware there are a few rules you have to follow just a couple of things that you've got to do. And, and I'm not going to go into those today because it, it's a whole nother set of complexities. Do you have to wait until your retirement age? Nope. You don't have to wait until you're 59 and a half. You know, if you've got an IRA, you can't take money out to your 59 and a half or you'll have a penalty. But in, in an account like this one, a 7702 account, you don't have to wait until you're 59 and a half. And, you know, at 72 and a half, there's no, I'm sorry, 72, right. there's no required minimum distribution. So those are all true to IRA accounts, but it's not true of section 7702 kinds of accounts. Now, one of the other things that's really kind of cool about this is if you get sick, and let's say you need long-term care, either in your home or in a facility of some type, it provides a magnified pool of funds that can be used tax-free to pay for critical illness in your home or in a long-term care facility. And then finally, Eric, if you never take the money out, you never spend it for long-term care, you never spend it for tax-free income just because you needed it, you never needed to take the money out, well, then it will go to your heirs tax-free. How's that sound to you? It's, it's pretty amazing. You know, until I started working with you, I had actually never heard of these. Um, I guess you, you, you might call them a 7702 type of account or, or they have different names for them, but what you know sometimes people call them different things well i've heard them referred to by all of those names and i will tell you by the way i use an account like this for myself i have an account like this set up for my parents most of my clients i would say 85 percent of my clients have these accounts set up there are a few of them who don't qualify for whatever reason and these accounts are called by a couple of different names you can call them a 7702 account if you wanted to uh, sometimes they're called PIRAs, Private Insured Retirement Advantage Accounts, PIRAs, or some people refer to them as LIRPs, L-I-R-P, which stands for Life Insurance Retirement Plan. What this really is, is it's a specially structured life insurance contract that is designed to minimize the death benefit component because all the expense in life insurance comes from those death benefits. So it's designed to minimize the death benefit component and follow the IRS rules in a way that allows it to maximize the buildup of the cash value inside the life insurance that can be withdrawn tax-free. And so when I say the word life insurance, a lot of people kind of roll their eyes, or I, I, at least I imagine that they are, are reluctant to enter into that conversation. And I want to talk for just a moment about why I think some people think that they don't like life insurance. It's because, first of all, what's been presented to them in the past and what they understand is not life insurance. What they understand is death insurance. You know, you put all this money in and you get it if you get more money out if you die. Well, that's not a topic anybody wants to address. 
And secondly, you put all this money in and if you don't die, then it feels like you never get any money back out of it. So that really is kind of death insurance. But what we're talking about is life insurance, the living benefits that can be created by a contract with an insurance company. And most people have never been shown how those living benefits work and how they can be used beneficially for them. No one's ever explained to them about the tax-free growth potential that exists inside life insurance that's unlimited. You see, in an IRA account, it's limited. In a Roth IRA account or a Roth 401k, it's limited. You can only put so much into those. But inside of a life insurance contract, which can grow tax-free, it's unlimited. And so people tend to feel like things are good for the insurance company and not good for them. And that's because they have never really understood how life insurance works. Now, I'll tell you this. If you've ever sat across from a widowed spouse and delivered a death benefit check, it causes you to feel dramatically different about life insurance. And just last week, I learned that a client of ours uh, has pancreatic cancer. And the prognosis is very bad. And the first thought that I had when I learned about this diagnosis was that I'm so glad that two years ago, we set this person up with one of these uh, LERP life insurance retirement plans, because though he isn't likely to live to enjoy the tax-free income, if he needs care at home or in a nursing facility, it's going to be paid for. And if he doesn't wind up needing that care, then his wife will receive hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional income to provide for her retirement. So uh, there's really a, a good thing about life insurance that a lot of people overlook. Yeah, because death benefits are really just one of the benefits of a life insurance of, of life insurance. The other benefits are really living benefits while you're part that you are able to benefit from without having to die to get the benefits. Yeah, that's kind of the life insurance part, the, the life portion of life insurance, because you don't have to die to get those benefits. And that's kind of a good thing. What is it? Clint Eastwood said, dying ain't much of a living boy. <laughs> and uh, you get an extra bonus if you know what movie that came out of. Yeah, I didn't think so. The Outlaw Josie Wales. Oh, yeah. I've seen it. I just don't know it. Yeah, that Eastwood well. said, dying ain't much of a living boy. And that's why nobody wants to talk about death insurance. Right. By the way, doesn't Bon Jovi have a song, uh, dying ain't much of a living boy as well? Now that's a good, that's a good pop culture. There's a, there's a song out there. I think, <laughs> it, I think it may be by Bon Jovi, but I'm not sure. So anyway, the whole idea is that there's, there's death insurance and there's living insurance. And the good part about living insurance is it provides tax-free income for life and tax-free health benefits, health care benefits for home care or for a nursing home. And that's the part that I think is the, is the key. Even people who don't like life insurance policies or, or whole life policies ha, will recognize that it's extremely important, even more so important today, that people get long-term care policies. However, if anybody's ever looked on the market and, and tried to purchase a long-term care policy, they have found that it's they're extremely difficult to get and almost cost prohibitive to get anymore. And so what's so unique about, about these types of plans or, or purchasing it with, along as a living benefit of your life insurance policy is that you're able to access that long-term care policy as, as a living benefit and in a, in a, in a much, afford, much more affordable way. Well, that's exactly right. And so while we hope that none of our clients ever use the long-term care provision, we know that uh, typically three out of four individuals age 65 and older are going to need long-term care of some type. Uh, you know, my grandmother needed it before she died. My dad, who's in his late seventies, doesn't need long-term care, but he did tell me yesterday, uh, funny conversation we were having on the phone. He said, I'm planning on getting old if you haven't thought about it. And he was explaining to me why he, why he was putting a fireplace insert in that burned gas instead of using um, wood. wood pellets. You know, I was trying to convince him to buy a pellet stove. And he's like, yeah. no, I don't want to deal with those 40 pound bags. My father-in-law did the same thing. All right. Well, so, I, yeah, and I have to confess that I'm facing this. You know, I'm only in my 50s, but uh, I don't find that I've got the spryness of leg that I had when I was in my 40s. Just <laughs> a young wee lad like you. And uh, unfortunately, you're going to find that out too. So it's important to have these strategies in place. In fact, I'll just go ahead and mention to you something my wife told me. Uh, when we set up my plan, um, 
she was looking at how the plan I have works. And she said, so this would buy your life insurance. Now you need to know I'm uh, six foot two and weigh about 270. My wife is, uh, I don't know, five foot one maybe and weighs about 109 pounds. So she's a little bitty. Right. And so she can't handle my body physically. She can't move me. Uh, but she's a registered nurse. She spent her entire career dealing with old men. And so she said, what this would allow me to do is she said, I could use this money to buy the muscle that is required to move you if you needed care. And she said, I could direct your care, but I would have to hire somebody else to be the muscle. And that's exactly what our particular LERP or Pyra plan does for us. And um, so that was just kind of my wife's uh, big reason for liking the plan. She liked that even more than she liked the tax-free income. So let me explain to you how one of these things works, because I think understanding that is really uh, the nitty gritty part of this. People have never heard of it for the most part. So here's what you need to know. The way this works is you set aside an amount of money each year. It can either come from your stream of savings if you're young and you're working. Uh, and you set that money aside into a specially structured life insurance policy. When I say your stream of savings, if you're young and working, for example, we're going to set one of these plans up for my daughter when she's home next week for Christmas. And we're probably going to start her in a modest way at something like $500 a month um, because she's only in her 20s and $500 a month buys her a huge amount of benefits in insurance. Whereas for somebody my age in his 50s, it won't do nearly as much for me. Now, if you're an older person, you may not actually fund it out of the stream of money that you're currently saving. You may fund it from money that you already have saved up. So you may have money in a, an account and you can take some of that money that you've got sitting in your account and effectively each year you can move some of it from one pocket on your pants to the other pocket on your pants. You own the pants. You own both pockets. It's just going from one type of an account to another type of an account, both of them having your name on it. And we might do that for a period of, oh, maybe seven to 10 years, moving just a little bit each year. Let me give you an example. Let's say you had $500,000 in investment accounts. If that $500,000 was earning 5% per year, how much income would it be producing, Eric? $25,000. $25,000, that's right. So what if we took those earnings, that $25,000, and we just took it out of the pocket that it's in and moved just the earnings, not the principal, over to one of these PIRA, Private Insured Retirement Advantage Accounts, or Life Insurance Retirement Plans, and repositioned the growth over to that type of plan and did that for a period of seven to 10 years, either in your last working years, or maybe even in the first few years of your retirement. How would that work? Well, I'm going to give you an example out of my own personal LERP plan, because I kind of think if you're going to talk about these things, you shouldn't talk about things that you're not doing. I don't think you should recommend things that you aren't doing. And I just feel like it's fair to say to people, hey, when I tell you about this kind of cooking, I'm eating from the same recipe. I'm doing the same kinds of things. And so here's an example of my own plan, which was set up when I was 53 years old. Now, you can buy these well into your 70s. I have heard of them being uh, used in cases where people were 80. Now, I, I've never used one in the 80s, but we have used them in the 70s. The thing to know is that the younger you start these, the better they work. But I did put my own mother into one of these plans when she was 74 years old. Now, the personal plan that I happen to have set up, and you can set these up at all different income levels and amounts of contribution to them. My personal plan, I'm putting in about $4,000 every month. So that's a pretty significant contribution that I'm making. And I plan on doing that every year until I'm 70 years old. And then I will stop contributing at that point. Now, what that does for me is it creates a plan that, first of all, does have a death benefit. And the death benefit increases every year as I contribute to the plan. It starts at about $800,000. And the death benefit will grow to be about $1.8 million. And so that's the reason I sleep at night with one eye open. <laughs> you know, if my wife finds out how much that death benefit is, it could be bad for me. I'm just joking. I better, love not, you. better not let that out. Yeah, I love you, baby. <laughs> it's all okay. 
Um, so, so I've got this death benefit that goes from 800,000 and it grows every year and it'll top out at about $1.8 million sometime in my late sixties. And let's just stop and think about that for a moment. If I got a bad health diagnosis, like our client who has the pancreatic cancer diagnosis, well, at least one of the things that I can have some confidence in is that if something happens to me, my wife's not going to be destitute. She's going to have seven figures right. over a million dollars tax-free that right. she can use to live on and provide for her. And she hasn't worked outside the home in many years. So she doesn't have a big pension or a big uh, 401k account or anything like that. She's depending on me to take care of her. And this is a way that I would have taken care of her. So my own plan not only provides that death benefit, but as I mentioned earlier, it provides a long-term care benefit. Now the amount of long-term care benefit that my plan provides is approximately $780,000. That's almost 800,000 bucks. You were going to say something. That's, that's a healthy amount. Well, it is a healthy care. amount. Yeah. You know, most people don't spend that much in long-term care uh, in our market here in Springfield, Missouri, USA, right in the heartland, the top end of long-term care that you can buy costs about $10,000 a month. If you were getting everything provided for you, you were in intensive yeah. long-term care, so to speak. Um, so that's going to be about $120,000 a year. So that would provide me about six years worth, maybe seven years worth of long-term care. And that would all be provided out of that account. And my wife wouldn't have to tap any of her other retirement accounts or any of the other financial assets to care for me. You see, that's one of the things that happens with this long-term care issue is we spend all the family money right. taking the first person through long-term care. Then that person dies and the surviving spouse has not only lost their spouse, but they've lost the financial, the family fortune as well. Right. And so many people, you know, especially serving in the state level, it's, it's really a hit on the state, but because so many people look to the state to take care of them in long-term care facilities and to get there, they've got to spend down their assets to get to that point. And they don't, I don't think a lot of people realize how devastating the, an event of, of someone going into long-term care can be on your, on, on, on all of your assets. You know, one of the interesting things about that is many of those people who do wind up depending on the state are actually very proud people. And I kind of grew up among these right. proud people. And for example, when I was a Would kid never growing take up, a welfare check. no, we qualified when I was a kid growing up for free lunches or reduced lunches at school. Right. But I remember as maybe a second grader hearing my dad speak about that and, you know, it just wasn't something we were going to do. We don't take welfare was kind of the idea. And so it's amazing to me how many people who grow up in that kind of atmosphere, who live all their life carving their own way, doing their own thing, get to the end and think, well, you know, I'll just let Medicaid pay for it. Not realizing that Medicaid is just welfare. It's welfare. Exactly. So, so we want to avoid that. And this kind of plan helps me avoid that. So what are my benefits? Well, I've got a death benefit of 800,000 to 1.8 million. I've got almost $800,000 in long-term care benefits. But the one I really like is the one that comes next. I've got a tax-free income that will start when I'm 70 years old, and it's going to be $95,000 a year tax-free, and it'll last till I'm 100 years old. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. You know, if you can't get by on $95,000 a year tax-free, well, maybe you're living too high, at least in the Missouri Ozarks. That's pretty good. And and so I think, I, you know, we get between would be on top of Social Security, well, on top of Social Security. That's exactly right. And any other pensions that might exist. And on top of that, I know how to cook and can and grow tomatoes and kill squirrels. And so I'm thinking we'll probably have a pretty good life that, in retirement. And that would now would that trigger Social Security taxation? No, it's a good question. Thank you. So if all the income I had was this $95,000 a year because it's plus not my even social security as income. The income doesn't even show up as income. That's right. right. There's no 1099 issued on this income. And so my social security then would be tax free. Right. So I would so, earn that income from age 70 to age hundred. Go ahead. So this, this is really kind of mind blowing because you, you could essentially be making hundreds of thousands of year in income and to the federal government, you're, you're making nothing. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The government would view you as, quote, one of the poor folks. Right. And therefore, they wouldn't charge you a tax on your Social Security. So let me give you a summary of this. Um, by age 70, I would have contributed, well, between now and the time I'm 70 years old, I would have contributed $816,000. Now, starting at age 70, if I live all the way to be 100 years old, I would take out $2.9 million 
in tax-free income. And when I died at age 100, I would still have $119,000 of death benefit left in my account. So when you total it all up, I received over $3 million in income and death benefit, all of it tax-free for investing only $800,000. That means that my tax-free profit was about $2.2 million. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Really is. Now, that happens to be based on a, an S&P 500 investment strategy that historically has averaged between 7 and 9%. But for the math on my own personal policy, the math was just done at 5.6%. Right. Being conservative. Yeah, exactly. And, and we always want to do the math at less than what we really expect. So that's a good point. So how they're invested and in, in the, how the, how the plant earns money is an important aspect for people to understand. Uh, it's very important. And you may remember, we did a podcast a few weeks ago on annuities yes, and how annuities earn money in the three different ways they can earn money. Same ways apply to an insurance contract that is called a LERP plan like this one we're talking about today. The money can be either invested at a fixed rate. And right now that's going to pay something in the Pretty range bad. of 2% or less. Yeah. Less. It could be a variable life insurance contract, which invests in the stock market and in some index of the stock market. Which comes with risk. Exactly. And so uh, right now your variable contracts are really booming and doing great. But when the market goes down in value by 45%, it really hurts your feelings. Or it could be used in one of the fixed index kind of contracts that we talked about last week that have a floor on them that you can't go below. And the particular floor on these life insurance contracts is zero. So the worst you'll ever do on a life insurance contract in terms of your earnings, even if it's a bad market year, will be zero, which leads us to the little mantra. Zero is your hero. Zero is your hero. That's exactly right. And in positive years, these contracts are going to give you market performance. Usually they've got a cap on them somewhere in the neighborhood of 9, 10, 11, 12% per year. Think about this, Eric. If you knew that your return was always going to be no worse than zero, that's the worst it could be. And the best it could be was nine or 10% per year. Could you live in that zone pretty happily? Yeah. 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 I think most people could, but people don't know about it. They don't know that it's available. And that's one of the reasons that they don't get to pursue these particular things. So some of the frequently asked questions to just kind of quickly go through them is one of them would be how much can you, are you required to put in? You know, it's really interesting because when people hear the word insurance, they, that's the first thing they want to talk about is how much do I have to put in wrong question to be asking? It's not how much do you have to put in? It's how much do you want to put in? Because we're not trying to solve some insurance problem here. I need a million dollars worth or $2 million worth of insurance. What we're trying to do is tuck as much money as possible away into a contract that just happens to have a death benefit associated with it and falls under the tax laws regarding life insurance. So the answer to the question is you can put in as little or as much as you want. I have clients who put in six figures a year, over $100,000 into these contracts. And I would say the smallest client puts in about $10,000 a year. If you can't put $10,000 a year into one of these, probably isn't quite worth getting started on one. So anywhere between those two numbers works. One of the ways that we sometimes kind of ballpark the idea of how much somebody want, might want to put into it is we see how many dollars in total assets are there in financial assets. And as we did the math earlier, for a person who had $500,000 in financial assets, if they're growing at 5% per year, well, we would say hmm, we're creating $25,000 a year that we could divert into one of these other tax-free kinds of an account. Or if a person had a million dollars, of course, that would bring them up to $50,000 a year. And at that level, we could probably start a tax-free uh, LERP account for both the husband and the wife. Um, so you begin to see kind of mathematically how we think about those it's kinds really of things. It really has to do a lot with their particular situation. Everybody gets to contribute at whatever level they want to. And of course, the more you put in, the more you get out of it. And then how long is, are you required to participate? Well, typically, um, you would probably do seven to 10 years. There isn't a real specific answer to that. For example, uh, I have one plan that we set up uh, where we made one deposit one time of a large sum of money and that's it and we were done. 
and we're not putting any more money into it. So you can do it just one year. You can do it just one year if you put enough in. We have other people who say, well, I'm going to put it in for the rest of my life because this is not money I need. I'm just creating a death benefit for my kids later on in the future. But most usually we set these up for somewhere between seven and 10 years. You know, and some one other question people might have is that since this is a tax um, free option, how long does this uh, gravy train run? I mean, will the government identify this and eventually tax this? Uh, great question. Um, the answer is the government has already identified it and know it, know it exists, uh, knows it exists rather. So here's kind of the way we think about that. When the government got wind of this and started looking at it a long time ago, <clears throat> It led to some legislation because what was happening is wealthy people were setting these plans up and they were setting them up. So they had only a hundred thousand dollars in death benefit and they were cramming a million dollars a year into their policy. And the government right. said, no, that you can't do that. That's right. cheating. Because really a lot of people who, if you make a, a lot of income, you can do this, but you can't do a Roth. So this is kind of for, for those high income earners you can see that this is the one tool that they're going to use. Well, and, and they were really using it excessively. And so the government came along and they adjusted the rules a little bit. And they said, there has to be a relationship between how much money you're putting in and how much death benefit the policy has in it. You can't just do a hundred thousand dollar policy and then put $5 million a year into it. That's no longer allowed. But the people who had those set up before the government passed those rules, which were in the TAMRA and TEFRA, those were the names, the acts that the Congress passed. If you had it set up before that, then you can still contribute as much money you want as you want to into those particular policies. And not have a very high death benefit. That's exactly right. Now, here's what we think. Um, we think the government's never going to mess with this. And there are two or three reasons. First of all, um, the government has a vested interest in people having life insurance. Right. Because the government doesn't want you to die and then depend on the government. The government needs you to take care of yourself. And having life insurance for you and your families is one of the ways that you take care of yourself. Right. So why would the government mess with that? Secondly, you have to look for the lobbies. Now, you're a senator. You get lobbied. Yes. And you get lobbied by the insurance lobby. Yes. And I don't know which lobby has the most money, but I'm pretty confident that the insurance lobby will be at the top of the heap. It's up there. Yeah. And so are you, you wanting to say something else or is that enough said well, and you and need I, to move on? Just as a legislator, I'm just thinking that it would be politically toxic to, to pass something that would go after people's life insurance policies. Exactly. I, so, so when I'm speaking in public, what I'll often do is I, I name our congressman, you know, here in the seventh district of Missouri, that's Billy Long. Shout out to Billy if he's listening to the podcast. And I'll talk about how imagine the death occurs and the hearse is going by with the body in the back of the hearse and mama and the little kids down around her ankles are hanging on mama's in her gingham dress. And the little kids are down around her knees, hanging on and sobbing. And imagine the voiceover on that commercial saying, call Billy long, <laughs> tell him to take his hands off your life insurance. <laughs> right. The government yeah. needs you to stay insured. And honestly, even I would say, especially at a state level, there's a big incentive for, state lawmakers to, to want people to have long-term care insurance because the more people that have got these policies, the fewer people that we're going to have to pay to go into a Medicaid nursing home. And and the state administers the Medicaid funds. And honestly, there's a, there's a probably a, there would be a return on investment uh, for those, you know, at least the taxes that we are foregoing as long as people have got these policies in place. Well, maybe we could get some additional tax benefit built into the legislation starting on what, January 3rd or 4th of this year. Uh, so uh, if I could put a little bug in your ear, Senator, why don't you see what you can do when you get but to Jeff City it for would, us? If anything that will benefit individuals and keep taxes back to the people. Yeah. Well, I think this is a solution that is going to be beneficial both to the state, but also benefit beneficial to the individual. And that's what I'm concerned about is benefiting the individual. And I don't think the government's ever going to get involved in this. And there's another reason for that. 85% um, of the Fortune 500 CEOs have these kinds of plans. Who's the Michigan State football coach? Is it Jim Harbaugh? I believe that's his name. There's a big uh, article that has been written and published abroad. A big part of his compensation and, you know, those guys earn what? I don't know, 10 or 20 or $50 million a year, some obscene number. A big part of his compensation is coming in the form of money that is being contributed to one of these kind of plans on his behalf. 
In fact, when we set these plans up for business owners, sometimes we'll say to them, do you have any employees that you really want to keep like a key person in the business? Well, let's set up one of these plans and let's put some money into a life insurance plan for them. And let's let them have control over that one tenth at a time each year over the next 10 years. And you've just glued that person in with what is called golden handcuffs. So those kinds of things are funded with plans like this. Do these LERPs have, what, tell us about the fees. Are the fees higher than normal? Are there any front-loaded fees? Well, the, the answer is yes and no. So people often think that insurance is a bad thing because the fees are really high on insurance. And the fact of the matter is, in the first few years, that's exactly true. The fees are really high. And the reason they're high is because insurance companies shove as much as possible of the expense they're going to experience over time into the first few years of an insurance contract. Yeah. So they're creating that. They're creating the, that financial mechanism for you. They're getting it all set up. So the expenses are all at the beginning. In the first few years, it's very expensive. But in fact, over the lifetime of one of these, the management fees on them wind up being somewhere in the neighborhood of one to one and a half percent, very comparable to what you're paying in a management fee on money that you have in an investment account managed. So what you have to bear in mind is this is kind of like walking down the street. And imagine you're going down a street and there are two thugs down on the street corner. Right. And on the left-hand street corner, there's a thug that has a big eye on his chest. And on the right-hand street corner, there's a little thug that has a little eye on his chest. Now, the big thug with the big eye represents IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. So to pass through this street, you either have to pay the big thug with the big eye, IRS, or you can pay the little thug with a little I, I-N-S, the insurance company. And in fact, the cost to pay the insurance company over a lifetime isn't really very high. It's comparable to the costs that are associated with a investment account. So if you're thinking short term, it's not a good this idea. This is not a short term deal. It's a bad idea short term. In fact, one of the things that I put on our illustrations when we're showing these to clients is I'll circle the first year and I'll write the word bad next to the first year because in the first year, it doesn't work very well. But long term. Long term, it works incredibly well. So one of the questions I think people may have, you you alluded to setting one up for your daughter and that it, it's a great to start early. What about people who are, you know, older? Is, or is there a point in which people are too old to sign up for something like this? Well, you know, I'm the classic example because I set one up for my mother when she was 74 and I'm setting one up next week for my daughter who is 24. Now it's going to benefit both of them but it'll benefit my daughter a lot more with a lot less money. In fact, I'm, I'm thinking that we'll probably set my daughters up with about $500 a month. We set the one up for my mother with a one-time deposit of $500,000. And so you see the difference between what you have to put in to take care of an older person and what you have to put in to take care of a younger person to get the benefit. But the fact is age is not really relevant. These work for any age, they just work better the sooner you start them. So you at 43 is better than me at 53 when I started mine, or at 57 as I am today, and certainly at, at the mid-70s. But we have clients routinely setting these up in their 60s and early 70s. And I think, finally, why are people only hearing about this now or possibly through us or for those people that are saying, I've never heard of a 7702 or a Pyra or a LERP. Why, what's... Uh, What's the answer to that question? Well, I think the answer is complexity. Um, it's a little bit hard for people to explain. I, you know, I've spent 20 some years learning to say this simply. And um, the first time you ever explain it, you explain it with a lot of complexity to it that's really hard. And we just learned how to articulate those complexities in the simplest possible way. And they don't teach that in life insurance salesman school. In fact, uh, when I first got my insurance license, which was in 1983, I believe, so that's been almost 40 years ago, um, they never taught me anything like this. I only had a vague notion that there was even a uh, cash value account attached to insurance. Nobody emphasized it. All they emphasized was how much death benefit and how much your premium cost was. And if you could get them the same death benefit for a lower premium, or if you could use the same premium and get more death benefit, that was the whole sales conversation right there. Nobody ever talked about this saving side of things. And I would tell you, most insurance agents don't know about it. 
they they have a vague notion that it exists, but they have no idea how to explain it. They have no idea how to talk about maximize funding like we are today. Put as much money as you can into it possibly and minimize death benefit. This is just not taught in insurance school. It's taught in very high level financial planner, advisor, tax strategy kinds of schools. And that's really where I went to learn it and how I figured it out. So, Eric, the big picture that I want you to have in mind as we wrap up today is this. LERP plans, life insurance retirement plans, or PIRAs, private insured retirement advantage accounts, they function like a supersized Roth IRA. They provide you with tax-free income without the typical requirements that come with an IRA. There's no age 59 and a half withdrawal limit. There's no age 72 and a half, age 72 required minimum distribution. And there's never any income tax to be paid as long as you follow just a couple of rules along the way. And I want you to remember that a PIRA or a LERP is just a part of the bigger picture. It's one source of tax-free income. It doesn't stand alone, but it'll be in combination with Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks and maybe Roth conversions that have already been set up for you. And hopefully if we've done our job well, then their social security will be tax-free because None of the income they're receiving from their Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, Roth conversion plans will have any taxes associated with them. And that means their social security won't have any tax charge either. So if you'd like to know more about reducing taxes now, today, this year, and in retirement, visit our website at savingyoutaxes.com, where you'll learn more about what we do. And you can reach out to us for more information or you can schedule a conversation and see whether or not we can help you. Now, I have to tell you, we can't help everyone. Twice this week, I've had to tell a business owner that they were not in a position where what we do would be helpful to them. But we do help many people. And the only way to find out whether or not you're one of those people that we can help is by reaching out to us. And you can do that by visiting savingyoutaxes.com. That's it for today's podcast. I hope you'll join my co-host Eric Burleson and me on another edition of The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. Thank you for listening to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of SavingYouTaxes.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your own qualified advisor with any questions you may have regarding taxes and investing.